All right, everybody, if I can get your attention so we can go ahead and get started, please. I always want to be obedient to the Lord. Uh, a couple people had something they want to share this morning. Uh, so do me a favor, if you'll welcome Miss Sue, please. <laughs> okay, I have, I have a word, and it has been burning and burning and burning inside me, and so I'm just going to let it out. In Psalm 111.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Psalm 112, 1, 2, and 3. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Amen. That's a wonderful word for for us, for, for believers. And, but what God has been showing me is out of revelations. There's two things. Number one, there's a white horse coming. Come on. That might sound like something really silly and simple, but I'm going to tell you what. When it comes, oh my gosh, it is going to be, we're the blessed ones. We're, sure. There's going to be so many people scared to death. There are going to be people, you read it, it says they're running to and fro, back and forth. They don't know what to do. They're scared. It's not going to come near us. Amen. We're not going to be scared. We're not, we're not going to worry or fret or anything. God's got us covered. And only with our eyes, well, Psalm 91, only with our eyes will we see all this right. we're not gonna we're not gonna participate in the bad stuff the bad stuff the scary stuff the fear the anxiety the stress it's not gonna bother us it's just we're gonna be fine we're gonna be happy we're gonna the people will see our peace and not understand it at all because they they don't know Jesus that's sad it's real sad. <laughs> but um, in Psalm, I mean, in Revelation 19 is where it talks about the white horse. And uh, it says, And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. And that's our God. That's our God. And um, in Revelation 12, 10 through 12, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of the brethren, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Amen. I mean, we should be ecstatic. Just knowing it. We don't have to see it. We just know it's going to be, we're okay. Right. And uh, it's important that we let everybody else draw people to you so that, um, not to yourself, but to Christ. So that they will have the peace and, and joy with, and not suffer through what's coming because the white horse is coming. And it's getting here sooner and sooner, and a lot sooner than you know. And that's it. That's what I want to do. <laughs> They're up here. 
Okay, this kind of goes with what Pastor Stan was saying earlier. Um, I'm not sure if y'all know my testimony, but I've been through multiple back surgeries, serious back surgeries, and there come there come a time that I'd gotten to the point to where I really thought that I wasn't going to be able to ride horses anymore, and um, that just I just couldn't think about it because that just broke my heart. And um, well, in the last two days, I've had the opportunity to ride and together in two days we got to ride 20 miles and i'm still able to get up here and walk around on top of that <laughs> so if you don't think god will give you the desires of your heart then just keep trucking along because he does and that's not even really what i came up here to share but you got to give god the praise <laughs> um yesterday we were riding and i was riding a horse that i had to just spur and spur and i don't like doing that i like them to just go and just go along with it so we decided to stop and let them get a drink in this bottom. And if you know how gumbo mud is, you know you're gonna you tend to bog down. And um, I fought this horse to get it just to go get a drink. <laughs> and so we got out there, and she just sunk like literally up to my stirrups. My I, I had dirt on mud on my boots. That's how deep we went. And I thought, and this is not a horse that's just going to jump up and go, you know, like some of them do. If something touches their foot, they come. Y'all all seen that meme off of Facebook where it jumps out of the water. No. She just buckled her knees and gave up. And I was like, uh, I looked at the lady I was riding with, and I told her, I was like, I don't know what to do with this. And she said, Gigger. And I was like, I don't like using spurs anyway. I'm just not that way. And so I kicked and kicked, and I felt like I was like a three-year-old kid sitting on this horse, and not the horse wasn't budging or anything. But I realized I was so bogged down that I didn't see what was going on around me, and I didn't see what how the little things I've let in my spiritual life build up to the point that I wasn't seeing what God was telling me to do. And I don't know if it's just me that the Lord used that word with because I've gotten so bogged down with uh, COVID and the pandemic and everything that's going on in crazy politics to just get so bogged down that I haven't given up, but I've taken my eyes from where they need to be. So I don't know if anybody else is out there that's bogged down into gumbo mud <laughs> up to their stirrups, but I suggest you grab a hold of the word that Pastor Stan said this morning because that was not an accident because I've never had a horse just lay down in mud like that and decide that she just wasn't going anymore. She was just done. And I was just going, no, no, we can't, we can't do this. And then immediately after I got her out of the mud, we had a vine wrap completely around one of her back legs. And instead of fighting like most of the time they would do, the more we wiggled and the more I moved her, the tighter it got. And I thought, well, I'm gonna have to get off and get this to get this vine off. And um, as Lisa said, I call her mom, but anyway, she said, just break it. Here I was fixing to get off in this mud. Lord knows how, how deep I'd go into the mud, but instead of just breaking off whatever is holding you back or whatever is keeping you in the bog down, we do that over and over. And I'm the same way, I just do it, I do it constantly. But I learn by visual and literal physical things. And a lot of the time the Lord uses that stuff to help me. So I thought after what Pastor Stan shared that that was, too, there was too much irony that that was God. So I just wanted to share. Thank you. Anybody here this morning that would actually say, Pastor, I feel like I'm bogged down in the mud. I feel like I want to give up. I feel like I just don't know which way to go. The more that I wiggle, the more that I move, the more things tighten up around me. I've got a word for you this morning, and I hope that you'll receive it. This morning on the prayer list, I prayed for my mother-in-law, Janice Wright. If y'all know my mother-in-law, she is a firecracker. Some people would say, no, she's more like TNT. <laughs> or nitroglycerin. When she explodes, it's, it's dangerous. And as we watch 
people get older and go through physical things, sometimes it's hard to watch, ain't it? And so her blood pressure has been really low. So last night, probably around about 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, something like that, I got a phone call from Janice, and she was madder than a hornet. And her blood pressure had been so, you know, really low all weekend. So we've been having to watch over it. And I pick up the phone, and I saw who it was. How many of you know that, you know, caller ID will at least give you a moment's notice or warning? So when you get a phone call later on, you're wondering what's going on. I pick up the phone, and I said, hey, Janice, or hey, young, or young lady, or something. I don't know what I said. And all of a sudden, this barrage came on the telephone. She goes, I can't take him anymore. He's about ready to um, make her really mad. Let's just put it that way. He has about got on my last nerve, and he is strumming it like it's the one last string on a banjo. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Who's got you mad? You know him. I was like, no, who is him? She said, that dang president, everything he says is a lie. And she says, I can't stand to hear anything more on him whatsoever. <laughs> and I jumped up and I said, chances are you probably need to hear him because it's getting your blood pressure up. <laughs> and I thought about that for a while. And you know, sometimes we get down in these little valleys, don't we? Sometimes we go through these moments where we seem like we're on a plane and everything's just doing just fine. Cruise control. And then all of a sudden, we've slid down a slippery slope and we're in the bottom of a valley. You know, only times I ever hear people rejoicing is when they're on mountaintops. When they're on mountaintops, boy, they're yelling out, God is great, God is wonderful, He's done this, He's done that. But let me ask you a question. How many of you know that sometimes it's more important to give God praise in the valley? Because sometimes we have to prophetically proclaim what God is fixing to do even before He's done it. And if we do that, then what that does is it puts into our mind who God truly is. Is God trustworthy? Yes, He is. Is God able? Yes, He is. Is God willing? Is God capable to move in your life today even though you're in a valley? You know, sometimes when we're up on top of the, the mountaintop, we're afraid to move. Because when things are good, we don't want to lose it, do we? Joey, this is not in your Scriptures. How many of you know the story of David and Goliath? during worship, and spoke to me because I'm going to be talking about the valley. I'm going to be talking about the mountains. You remember when all of Israel and the Philistines were sitting and camped against each other and Goliath is coming out and calling out the Israelites? Interesting thing is, is the battlefield was in the valley. They were both up on two hilltops. And they were looking at each other, and as Goliath would come out and go down in the valley, and he would call out unto Israel, send down a man unto me. Send somebody out that we can fight. King Saul and all of his army were sitting up on top of the mountaintop, and they were afraid to move. But the enemy challenges you out and calls you out. And sometimes you're called to go into the valley to fight a fight. But if you know who's calling you out, then you know who's sending you. And if God can turn around and send David to a sword fight with a couple of stones, how many of you know that God can make you victorious in the fight that you've got to fight? Let me ask you a question. When you look at David, you know, some people say that you look at how tall Goliath was, and uh, how many of y'all have ever seen somebody that's six foot seven, uh, six foot nine, something like that? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did a wedding um, for a young man and a young lady that I loved dearly, and I got a chance to do the premarital counseling on video. 
And, you know, that's something different because when you see somebody sitting on a couch, it's a little, it's a little more interesting. You don't truly understand how tall they really are. And this little girl, is I've, I've known her for quite a few number of years, and I love this girl. You know, I'm happy for her. I'm proud to watch her grow and become the person that she is. So being the fatherly type person, I throw out a few threats to this young man. I'm like, you better treat her right. Her daddy owns a gun store and a gun range. We will hunt you down. And I even told him during the video, I tried to be like Leslie Nielsen. Say, I've got a special set of skills. I will hunt you down. You know, we're laughing, we're cutting up, and we're having a little fun about it. But then I go to meet him for the practice, and I knock on the door, and all of a sudden, he answers the door. And I remember, I like to look people straight across, okay? I'm used to either looking straight across or barely up, but mostly down. But when I have to go like this, and then you have to backpedal. I was just kidding about those threats. You know that, right? And then they come out, he's a fireman, so he's in good shape, you know, and all these things. And I sit there and I kind of laugh because we've all had those moments when we've had to look at something bigger than us. And we've all gotten scared, amen? David, in that moment, did not look at the valley as a place to fear, but he looked at the valley as a place to go so that he could fight a fight. I want to encourage you today, if you have a fight that's in your life right now, quit running from your fight. Stand your ground. If God is for you, with God all things, Some people say, Pastor, it's easier said than done. How can we stand this fight? First of all, you don't have to. Remember the scripture that I told you this morning. In Isaiah 43, in the very last verse, in verse 7, said, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Do you realize that you were made for God's glory. You are very special. You are very unique. You're not a problematic person. You're just a person that's got some problems. But how many of you know all problems can be handled? Just ask Dr. Phil. If y'all would turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 20, please. As y'all turn there, let me pray real quick. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Father, we thank you that, Lord, as we look to see what you speak to us today through your word, Father, we thank you that, Lord, as a prophetic word comes forth to the church, that, Lord, the church will hear it. That, Lord, we will no longer run from our battles because our battles are yours to fight. All we have to do is stand. As your word says, when we've done everything we can do to stand, just stand. So, Father, today we want to stand in your presence. We want to stand in your glory. Lord, we want to be transfigured and transformed into your very likeness. So, Lord, we ask that, you, Father, that you would come, that you would revive us, that, Lord, that you would give us a mind of like Christ, that, Lord, we would be more like you. So, Lord, we love you. We praise you. Lord, allow this word to wake up individuals that are going through these times. Father, to encourage those that are already waiting and for, Lord, those that have already been through the battle, that, Lord, this word is used to encourage them to share with other people. So, Lord, we love you, we praise you, we glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1 Kings chapter 20, everybody was looking to pick on Israel back in the day. And do you know that the history of this world has not changed? The world is still picking on Israel today more than any other nation in the world. Do you know that in the UN, the, the nation of Israel has had more uh, rulings against it than any other nation 
in the history of the UN. Do you know that UN doesn't understand who Israel really is? Israel is God's chosen people. Because we have a Savior that is a, or an Israelite, is a Jew, guess what? We have been grafted in to Israel. And because we've been grafted into Israel, we have the opportunity to be called His chosen people. How many of you know it's good to be known as being chosen? Starting in verses 1 through 4. It says, Now Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, mustered his entire army. How many? He gambled everything. His entire army, accompanied by 32 kings, with their horses and chariots. He went up and he besieged Samaria and attacked it. He sent messengers into the city to Ahab, king of Israel, saying, This is what Ben-Hadad says, Your silver and gold are mine, and the best of your wives and children are mine. The king of Israel answered, Just as you say, my lord the king, I and all I have are yours. The enemy has been surrounding you recently and he's been messing with you and he's trying to tell you that everything that you have is his to give it over to him. But the Word of God says that he did not call the people of God to be quitters. That he called the people of God to be fighters. If God is for you, let me ask you a question. Do you realize that God is for you? Because if you do not realize that God is for you, you're truly missing out on who you are. Remember it said that those people who are called by my, whose name are you called by? Are you called by the God of Israel? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? The God of whatever your name is? Is He your God? If He is, then all of a sudden it takes the pressure off of you that you don't have to fight these fights. But you do have to stand against them. Do you know that the devil is saying the same exact thing that Ben-Hadad is saying today? Your money is mine. How many of you know that people are throwing away money on trash today like nobody's business? They're giving it away, and let me tell you something right now, it is the saddest thing. The Bible says that we need to be wise stewards of our money, right? Do you know that you need to defend your money? You need to make sure that your money don't go to foolish things, especially the works of the enemy. Do you know that when Ben-Hadad said that your wives and children are mine, do you realize that the devil has been trying to steal your family for a long time? That he has been making your children fall victim to his schemes? Why? Because they are unaware of God's Word. I don't know about y'all, but I heard a song here a while back called, I Have a Drug Problem. I got drugged to church every Sunday. How many of you realize we need to get back to a point where we start teaching our children who God is in their life? If our children do not understand who God is in their life, what are they going to grow up thinking? Now I'm sick and tired of hearing the world say, but that's just how y'all think. Yeah, I think that way, but the reason I think that way is because God has proven Himself time and time and time again. To be honest with you, I don't think America would be here if it wasn't for the providence of God. And to be honest with you, our government needs to understand that because of the providence of God, we have a responsibility. And our responsibility is to defend our homeland, to defend our families, to defend our way of life. How many of you know you need to defend your property? I don't know about y'all, but looking down in South Texas, and now we got all these people crossing the border. And you hear these people talking about now fences are being torn down every night. Cattle are getting loose, and we don't know what's going to happen. Let me tell you, people on the border are living in fear. And to be honest with you, in the church, in the same exact thing. We allow the enemy to cross over into our borders and we don't stand against them and we don't stop them. We just say, well, we, it's, the government won't defend us. Let me tell you something. Get up off your butt and start getting on your knees and start praying God to defend you. 
Start praying that God would protect your house because if God supports you, this is going to be a common theme today, so get used to it. If God is for you, guess what? You got it going on. What God gave you, He gave to you. He didn't give to you to give to the devil. Do you know that was one of the problems that we had with Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve was given the garden. But the devil tricked them. Remember we talked about here with Sue up here a minute ago, we talked about the accuser of the brethren. Do you know that you are the brethren? Some of you say, hey, that gender don't fit me. Well, hey, sorry. I'm not a part of that culture. When I see things like Mr. Potato Head no longer being able to be called Mr. Potato Head, when I see that they want to take Elmer Fudd and Yosemite Sam's guns away, when they're picking on Pepe Le Pew off of Looney Tunes, the world has lost its ever-living mind. And yet, that's the kind of people that want us to live like them. And let me tell you something, I can't live like that. I have to live like what God is teaching us. How many of you have spoken to God and God's spoken to you about something in your life and you thought, man, I, I don't know if I want to deal with that. I don't know if I want to go that far. But I need to tell you, you need to be willing to go all the way. You can't be halfway committed to God. You have to be all the way committed to God. Our families cannot be halfway committed to God. We have to be all the way committed to God. If our families are not committed all the way to God, we're going to have some major faults in our armor, some major chinks, and you're going to get hung up. In verses 5 through 10 there in 1 Kings chapter 20, the messengers came again and said, this is what Ben-Hadad said, I sent to demand your silver and gold, your wives and your children, but about this time tomorrow I am going to send my officials to search your palace and the houses of your officials. They will seize everything. How much? Everything that you value and carry it away. The king of Israel summoned all the elders of the land and said to them, See how this man is looking for trouble? When he sent for my wives and my children and my silver and my gold, I did not refuse him. How many of you know that's a sorry, poor excuse of a man? How many of you know we don't need people like that leading nations? Verse 8, The elders and the people all answered, Don't listen to him or agree to his demands. So he replied to Ben-Hadad, Messengers, tell my lord the king, Your servant will do all that you demanded, the first time, but this demand I cannot meet. They left and they took the answers back to Ben-Hadad. Then Ben-Hadad sent another message to Ahab, May the gods deal with me be ever so severely, if enough dust remains in Samaria to give each of my men a handful. Guys, I want you to hear this, and you need to understand this. The enemy doesn't just want just a little bit. He wants everything. When the devil starts making a command, when he starts giving you word, he says, I want your money, I want your gold, I want your wives, and I want your children. Let me ask you a question. What makes you think he's going to stop with that? He's going to come after everything that you hold near and dear to you. How many of you know there shouldn't be anything in your possession that you value more than your wife and your children? Oh, come on. Do you hear what I'm saying? That there's nothing in your possession that should be worth more than your wives and your children. Maybe I better say wife and children. My house we lost our house. We lost our jobs. We lost our cars we would still have each other. And if we still have each other, we have a chance for a new beginning. How many of you have had to start over before? There's nothing wrong with starting over. 
Let me tell you something. Money comes and goes, don't it? If you don't believe it, look at the first of the month. Money comes and goes. But true love, true love, that's only a gift that God can give. Do you know that at the end, if He takes your family, takes your wealth, He will also rob you of your identity? I want to ask you a question. Who are you? What is your identity? Is your identity based upon who you think you are? Or is your identity based on who God said you are? That song that we sang earlier, I am who you say that I am. What has God called you? Who has He said that you are? Who has God spoken to you about in your life to surround yourself with? Do you know that you need to be surrounded by godly people? Do you hear me? I think I'm fixing to go home. You're not hearing me. You need to be surrounded by godly people. How many of you have ever heard of Ray Stevens? You know, the Mississippi Squirrel Revival. I graduated from the same high school that Ray Stevens graduated from. His real name is not Ray Stevens. His real name is Ray Trailer. And... He used to do concerts back there for fundraisers all the time. And I bought some cassette tapes for y'all young people. Y'all may not know what they are. They, they were a two-sided musical thing that you used to put in this instrument. And it had this little tape that would come down and it would play music. It was the upgrade from the eight, from the eight tracks. And some of you are saying, say, What? But I bought this CD, and it was called The Greatest Hits of Ray Stevens. And back in those days, I used to love to go to wrestling. How many of you remember Ric Flair? Woo! How many of you remember Dusty Rhodes? The Bionic Elbow. How many of you remember Magnum TA and the Road Warriors and all those, those guys? That's what I grew up with. And he had this song. There was actually two songs that was on it. And it was, the song was called The Ballad of the Blue Cyclone. I dare you to go home and pull it up on YouTube and listen to it today when you go home. Apparently in the song, apparently this guy goes to the wrestling match and this little old lady in front of him starts getting mad at this wrestler called The Blue Cyclone. And she apparently hits him with her cane. And I'm here to tell you, in every wrestling match, there's always an old lady with a cane on the front row. So the guy turns around and all he sees is this character and he commences to whooping him badly. And so he starts healing and he's got two friends. One of them's named Bubba. And he says, man, we need to go down there and we need to go find the blue cyclone and we need to go have a fight and we'll take it to him. I got a couple of redneck friends. They'll wade through hell to fight a circular saw. That, that phrase has stuck with me throughout the years. I'm not preaching to you about the stupid song. I want to ask you a question. Do you have friends in your life that would wade through hell to fight a circular saw for you? Do you have people that would do the incredible to make sure that you're okay? Now in the song, they get to the bar and they pick the fight and they turn around and those two dudes have gone. I guess they got stuck in the mud and got in the bar and they couldn't go anywhere. They gave up. But I want to tell you something. God gave us something. He gave us this person called Jesus Christ. Your identity should be in Him. In verses 11 through 13, it says, The king of Israel answered, Tell him, or one who puts on his armor should not boast like one who takes it off. Then Ben-Hadad heard this message while he and the kings were drinking in the tents, and he ordered his men, prepare to attack. So they prepared the attack, the city. Meanwhile, a prophet came to Ahab, king of Israel, and announced, this is what the Lord says. 
Do you see this vast army? I will give it to you in your hands today, and then you will know that I am the Lord. There's somebody here today that's walking through a very dark valley, and right now you feel very alone, and you feel very afraid. Much like King Ahab, and King Ahab was not a godly person. If you study the life of King Ahab, he was a very bad guy. But God didn't see Israel because of King Ahab. He saw Israel because of Israel. But because King Ahab was in charge, he said, I will show up and I will support Israel because as the king goes, so goes the nation. Do you know that God has had to deal with some pretty shady people in the past? And do you know that He's not finished dealing with some pretty shady people? Because if that was the case, we would all be in trouble. We have all been kind of shady in our past, haven't we? It's kind of like that sticker, I wouldn't kill somebody, but I'd do some pretty shady things for tamale. Listen to me. God wants you to understand who you are and who your identity is. Because you're grafted into Israel, God is going to speak to people to defend you. But God said, I am going to give this army over to you. Now here's the thing about it is, and why did he say that he would do that? So that they would know that he was God. What was that? Never mind. I was wondering if it was the Spirit beginning to move. Verses 14 through 21. When God says that He's fixing to give you the battle or He's fixing to give you the victory, how many of you know it's easy for us to start questioning it? Wondering how that's going to happen? Who cares? But in verses 14, But who will do this? asked Ahab. The prophets replied, this is what the Lord said. The young officers of the providential commanders will do this. And who will start the battle, he asked. The prophet answered, you will. So Ahab summoned the young officers of the provincial commanders, 232 men. Then he assembled the rest of the Israelites, 7,000 in all. They set out at noon while Ben-Hadad and the 32 kings allied with him were in their tents getting drunk. The young officers of the providential commanders went out first. Now Ben-Hadad had disputed or dispatched scouts who reported, men are advancing from Samaria. He said, if they have come out for peace, then take them alive. If they've come out for war, take them alive. Then the young officers of the providential commanders marched out of the city with the army behind them, and each one struck down his opponent. At that, the Armenians fled with the Israelites in pursuit. But Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, escaped on horseback with some of the horsemen, and the king of Israel advanced and overpowered the horses and the chariots and inflicted heavy losses on the Armenians. This is where I need to speak prophetically to the church. When the battle starts, it's going to be the young men that are ready for a fight. How many of you know we need some young men in the church? We need young men willing to stand up and be able to be godly people. I look around and I see young men in this church that I know that has a future, that I know that can be a great warrior for God. And when the king starts looking around and says, but who will fight this fight? Who does God turn to? The young men. The young men. Why? Because they got some fight in them. How many of you remember what it was like being 15, 16 years old and you thought that you could take on anybody until your 50-year-old dad spanked you? Until your football coach made you get out there and do push-ups and sit-ups and run? Until you found out that you wasn't tougher than everybody else? But somewhere along that 16 to 18-year age group, you graduate into this place where all of a sudden now you're eligible to be in the military. And when you go into the military, they teach you that you know absolutely nothing. And they teach you everything that you need to know to be a warrior. 
When I went into boot camp, I thought that I was Mr. Bad Son of a Gun. I came out of boot camp licking my wounds. Why? Because I found there were people that were tougher, meaner, and more agitated than I was. Do you know we need people like that in the church body today? We need to be teaching our children from the young ages of who they are in Christ Jesus. We need to be teaching them that these young men need to be prepared for a fight because remember Sue said there's a white horse coming. There's a period in history that is fixing to be revealed where you need to be ready to fight. You need to be prepared. It's harder to heal when you're older, right? How many of you have reached the past, the point of no return for youth? When I went to the doctor this last week, I still had some fluid on my knee, and I was sitting there disappointed when I left, to a degree, because I kept saying, you know, when I was 20, this was nothing. 20, man, we'd be over this no time. We'd be on back at it. Well, I ain't 20. But then again, I also don't run to fights anymore, neither. Now I like to sit back and teach other people. We need young people in our lives. 1 Kings 20, 28, something happens. We saw where the Israelites went and they beat everybody. Unfortunately, the king of Aram got away. And he goes back, if you read up to the story, up to verses 28, uh, they go back to their homeland, they lick their wounds, they try to figure out what happens. Uh, their wise men says you need to build another army exactly like what you had before. But because Israel's God is a God of the mountains, we will fight him in the valleys. There's a lot of first going on this morning. To Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Tell him, Pastor, said hi. In 1 Kings 28, God has something to say. He's heard. So, God, what have you got to say this morning? Pull it on up here. We'll put it on the microphone. That way everybody will hear. In 1 Kings chapter 20, starting at verse 28, this prophet, this man of God came up and told the king of Israel, let us close in prayer. Who is your service provider? <laughs> For the fifth time, verse 28. Says, the man of God came up and told the king of Israel, this is what the Lord says. Because the Armenians think that the Lord is God of the hills, and not God of the valleys, I will deliver this vast army into your hands, and you will know that I am the Lord. I want to share something with you. That ticked God off. His honor. God will stand up and share. And so when people start limiting God and start saying, He is just God of the mountains. You see, they forgot about who David was. They forgot about Goliath. They forgot about all these things. Why? Because if they would have remembered, then all of a sudden they found out that Israel would not be eaten in the valley. And some of you are in a valley today and you're wondering, why are you in this valley? Why ain't I making access? Why ain't I getting out of here? Here's the, have you waited for God to fight your battle for you? Have you picked up your five stones? 
Have you gotten your sling ready? Because let me tell you something. Here's the funny thing about it. Although that God gave victory to David, David participated in the battle. He had his slingshot. He had his five stones. What have you brought to the fight? Have you fought? Have you brought your preparedness? Are you ready? If you turn over to Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Y'all ain't going to believe this, but I'm actually going to finish today. Miracles are still happening. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. For those that are in the valley, I need to tell you that you've got a mountaintop coming. You have got a moment coming where Jesus is fixing to reveal Himself to you and who He truly is. And just as in this story that we're fixing to read, Jesus took His three best men and they went on a journey together. And it says, After six days, Jesus took with Him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Where? A high mountain. And it says that um, by themselves, there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them and a voice from the cloud said this is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased listen to him when the disciples heard this they fell face down to the ground terrified but Jesus came up and touched them get up he said don't be afraid when they looked up they saw that no one except Jesus and as they were coming down the mountain Jesus instructed them don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. See, the valley is where we fight, but the mountains is where we experience God. You see, when we've been delivered out of the valley, and all of a sudden we're no longer trying to fight to climb up, and we're able to look back and say, look what my God did. Then we start worshiping, don't we? And then when we start worshiping, the revelation of who Christ Jesus is comes to us. When it says Jesus was transfigured, and light came, You know, there's a story in the Old Testament about Moses that was transfigured just exactly the same way. And he had to put a veil over himself so that the other people couldn't see it. But I am here to tell you today that when Jesus comes to you and you've been changed, you need to let your light shine so other people can see it. Why put a veil on it and cover up who God is in your life? Guys, let me tell you something. After this last blackout, I needed some Jesus to transform me. Why? Because I was tired of not having electricity. And if we just get into the Word and get transformed by the Word of God, guess what? We may not need generators because we've been rejuvenated. How many of you are ready to be rejuvenated? How many of you have got some fights that you need to fight when you leave here today? During worship this morning Aisley comes up there and she kind of pulls on my sleeve and I look down and she looks and she's got this big bright smile on her face and she said I may be fixing to buy a horse and I was like oh really what you got and she tells me about the name of the horse and she said it's on sale How many of you know that's where they start with the young ones? Amen. It's on sale. And I said, really? It's on sale? She said, yep. But we got to see if I can afford it and see if I can get it. And I looked at her and said, Aisley, you want me to pray for you to be able to get that horse? She said, yep. <laughs> so while the praise and worship team was praying or singing, I stopped to pray for this little girl. How old is Aisley now? Seven years old, and praying for her for this horse. She had the loudest amen I've ever heard. 
Why? Because she was taking this promise, taking this prayer, and she was applying it to her life. So, Mama, I hate to tell you, you better suck it up and you better be shelling out. Amen? And so all of a sudden, I'm sitting here seeing this girl, and she is so in love with the fact that she might get this horse. If she don't, I feel sorry for you, okay? (laughs) But she knew that once we prayed for it, it was a done deal. Do you have that same childlike faith? Where that when you pray for something that you know it's a done deal? That God said that He would fight your battles for you? The God of the mountains, guess what, will meet you in the valleys. But let me tell you something. Don't make your home there in the valleys. Don't make your home down there. Get on your shoes and start getting out of the valley. Start coming up to the mountain. Start being like Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And get up on top of that mountain. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I need those cloud moments. I need to see it when the presence of God is so thick in your life, in my life, that all of a sudden you can't see nothing but this pea soup fog. And then all of a sudden the voice of God speaks and said, this is my son whom I'm so well pleased with. Listen to him. Do you know that wasn't the first time that God spoke over Jesus? That was the second time. First time was at the baptism. How many of you know we need to hear God speak concerning Jesus? Because if we understand who Jesus is, then we understand who our Heavenly Father is. And guys, I'm here to tell you, you got an awesome Heavenly Father. For you young men, suit up. The battle is coming to you. For you young men, get prepared. Life is not about video games. It's not about money. It's not about fast cars. It's about serving and honoring an almighty God that wants to use you and promote you to places that you can't dream of even going. But God says he's going to use your young men. Young women, that doesn't take away from who you are. Do you know that you're warriors as well? You are. You have value. You have worth. And God looks at you as a special child. Each and every one of you. I want to ask that you bow your heads and close your eyes because I want to ask you this question. Just with a simple hand, I'm going to ask you this question. Are you in a dark place right now? Are you in a place where you're fighting a fight? You're fighting a battle and you need to have victory? Maybe you need to understand who your identity is. Maybe you need to hear God speak into your life concerning who you are. If that's you, would you please raise your hand today because I want to make sure that you leave here today. No, and I see that hand, ma'am. Anybody else? I see that hand, sir. I see that hand, sir. I see that hand over there, ma'am. Anybody else would say, Pastor, I need to be released from this fear, this shame, I am called to be victorious. If you are, I'm going to ask that you make your way to the altar right now. As you do, Miss Brenda's got something she wants to share. If you raised your hand, please do me a favor. Do yourself a favor. Get up and come down here right now so that you can meet God. It may seem like a long journey, but I promise you it's not. Just come on down. Ms. Brenda. I have been um, sitting over here just bouncing in my seat, basically. The Lord spoke something to me in my quiet time this morning. And he has just repeatedly showed throughout this service today. He is so good. Oh. Sorry, his spirit has just been all over me today. Lord, I thank you, Jesus. (sighs) 
I was reading in Exodus this morning um, when he brought the Israelites out of Egypt. They were slaves for 430 years. 430 years they were slaves. He had 10 plagues that went through there. He protected them through it all. He's bringing them out. This is when they first were coming out of Egypt. He didn't take them to the direct path to the promised land. He took them through the wilderness because he knew that they weren't ready for the Philistines that would be there to attack them, okay? So he detoured them. And so then the Egyptians come out after them. And even after everything that God had showed them, the protection over their life that whole time when they were in slavery, he had promised them he was bringing them out of slavery, and he did, okay? But the Egyptians came after him. And as soon as they saw those Egyptians, they panicked. They panicked. He had already taken them to victory, but they still panicked because their enemy was still chasing them. And so they cried out to the Lord. And then they went against Moses, and they're saying, you know, how, you know, could, could, they wanted to go back to slavery. They wanted to go back and be... They were like, isn't there graves for us in Egypt, enough graves for us then for us to come out and die in the wilderness? They were willing to go back to the slavery that they had been in for 430 years. And Moses told them this. This is what he told them. He said, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. And somebody needs to know today, you have been fighting a battle. You have been fighting a battle over and over and over again. And God has revealed himself to you over and over again. Yet you are not taking the action. He goes on to tell right here, and um, this is Exodus 14, verse 15. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. You have a part in your victory. The Lord provides that victory. He provides the way, but you have to move. You have to do your part. And so many times we sit there crying out to God and praying to him, Lord, show me, show me, show me, show me, Lord. But yet we never move. We never move. And what did he do when they moved, guys? What did he do? He parted that Red Sea. And I want to tell you something right here. This went all over me this morning, and I could not get it off of me today. They didn't walk in that mud that she was talking about she got bogged down in. What did they walk? What did they cross in? Dry land. Dry land. He made that ground dry for them. They didn't have to trudge across there or trudge whatever you want to say across there and fight their way across the Red Sea. They walked. But it took them moving and taking that first step. And so I just felt like that the Lord was saying, I thought this was for a message in a couple weeks I have to give, and it probably will be, but God has revealed himself here today, y'all, like I have not seen in a long time in this place. And I'm just telling you, he has been here from the moment that we walked in this door today. And if you do not take this opportunity to release whatever you continually go back to, whatever you are enslaved to, no matter what it is, no matter how big, no matter how small, if you do not take that first step today, you are gonna continue to be in slavery because you will not do your part. God has made the way for you and it is time for you to take that step in faith and go and do what he has called you to do. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Father, as we celebrate today, Father, what you have done. Father, we not only celebrate what you have done, but what you are doing and what you yet will do. Father, I declare that these people that have come to the altar today, they are victorious in Christ Jesus. That Lord, as they've taken a step of an action, that Lord, as just Brenda just said, get to stepping. Father, I pray over these people today. Lord, I pray over this whole congregation that, Father, they walk with honor, with integrity, with authority, with power. That, Lord, as they go forth, that, Father, they will be the people that realized that the enemy can't back them into a corner because you'll be the one to fight us out. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name 
that the enemy has no weapons. But Lord, You have given us spiritual weapons, and those spiritual weapons are designed to pull down strongholds, to defeat the enemy, to pull them back. So Lord, Your Word says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. That Father, with that being the case, it doesn't mean that we won't be attacked, but it means they won't win. Because Jesus Christ already gave us the victory. He already gave us the fight. It's already said. It's already done. It's already over. So, Father, I speak over these victorious people today. That, Father, they are the head, not the tail, the top, and not the bottom. That, Father, they are blessed in the country. They're blessed in the cities and the highways and the byways. They're blessed in their homes, their families, their businesses, their crops, their herds. Their barns are full, and Lord, not to their own glory, but Lord, to yours, that Lord, they need more neighbors around them to take the overflow. So Lord, we love you, we praise you, we glorify you. Father, we speak life, we speak victory over these people. We speak encouragement and hope. Where the devil has brought the shadow, we see that the Bible tells us in John that Jesus was the light to all men. And the darkness could not understand it. So Father, come transfigure us today. Let us walk with that glory, with that light that can't be hidden. Let it be so evident that we love you, Lord, that as a result we've been changed. So Father, these are your people. Lord, I ask that you bless them. In Jesus' mighty name. All God's people said, Amen. If you're victorious, give the Lord a hand, a little loud shout. Amen. Hallelujah. Y'all are released. Go in God's care.